I imagine that there are a number of people in the audience that have heard about the Moth Story Hour. Yes? Yeah, oh, right. I imagine that this audience would know about that. So the Moth is the founding father and mother, and mother of the storytelling phenomenon that's sweeping through the United States. For example, in Boston at any night uh, in the fall and winter on, on a Sunday or Monday, once a month you can go to Cambridge or JP or Somerville and participate in a story slam. Typically there's a particular theme like fear or nine to five or betrayal and you have to tell a story about that theme. So on January 20th of this year, 2013, which is the 71st anniversary of an event that has great importance to my life even though it happened two years prior to my being born, I've decided I'm going to go to Doyle's Cafe, an Irish pub in JP, to tell a story about the theme is pets. Now the problem is I have no stories about pets. I can't think of one and I'm getting more and more depressed and this is a very bad scene until suddenly I make a connection between that anniversary, which I'll tell you about, and this theme and I have an idea for a story. So I arrive, it happens to be the Houston Patriots playoff game and of course there are many people gathered watching television in the front part of JP, but behind this television scene are a hundred people on small tables drinking beer, eating dinner, here to listen to stories from everyday people and to tell stories. And you're required to put your name in a hat and if it's drawn you get to tell it, so reluctantly I put my name in. And nervously I waited through the first five or six stories until my name is called out. So now I have to go. And up I go to the front of the stage. There's a microphone. A timekeeper here is showing me a clock. I have to finish my story in five minutes. There are judges sitting here, and the audience panel is going to judge as well. This is a very serious moment. But here's my story. I had to pluck up all my courage to ask my mother a question that I asked her over and over again. Mom, how come when you left Germany in 1935 to go to South Africa, you didn't go with your parents and your brother Eric? A grim look would come over her face and she always gave me the same answer. Well, we all gathered at the station and my mother said, we ought to all get on the train with Hilda. But my father, who was a veterinarian in town, said, no, 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 they need me in this town, there's nothing to worry about, we'll all be okay. And my train left as I waved goodbye to them. Now, I knew when my mother told me this story that she never again saw her parents or her brother. 
Thus, the need to keep on plucking up courage to ask that question. Anyway, I grew up in the warm embrace of the German Jewish community in Johannesburg, South Africa. And one couple in that community, Herbert and Mariana, had two beautiful golden cocker spaniels they named Psyche and Eros. And Psyche and Eros had a litter of puppies, one of which we got to adopt, and we named her Honey. And she was delicious for many reasons more than just her beautiful golden brown color. And for instance, I would ride my bike up the driveway coming home from school, and Honey would come pelting out of the house, sort of, she had a way of lifting her upper lips as if she was laughing with pleasure at seeing me. And she would hurl herself into my arms, and we'd roll around in great joy with each other. One day, my mother announces, we're going to immigrate to the United States. I've found some family there, and for the first time, you're going to have some real family. Well, two weeks prior to departure, a strange couple comes driving into our driveway, walks into our house. Why are they here? Well, they've come to adopt honey. They've come to adopt honey. That was never the part of the plan, never something I'd imagined. But there they were, taking honey down to the car, and just before she got into the car, she looked at me with a look that I've never forgotten. It was a look of reproach and dismay, as if she was saying to me, how could you be doing this to me? One week later, I have to pluck up all my courage again, this time to ask my mother a very different question. Mom, what happened to Honey? That grim look. Honey has run away and nobody can find her. For, for weeks, months after that, I'm sort of beset with this image of Honey running through the streets of Johannesburg looking for me. For me, the one who had abandoned her. And, you know, I, I beset as I was with grief and, and guilt, the only consolation I had was that I felt I came a little closer to understanding the scene that my mother must have been seeing over and over again in her mind's eye as she saw felt the train moving out of Münster, Germany in 1935 and waving goodbye to her parents and her brother for the last time. And I began to come closer to all the feelings that were embedded in that grim look. And I took my seat with my friends, my wife, the judges announced the winner of the evening from their point of view, and the audience winner was me. And that was a great shock to me. I, I spent the week sort of struggling to grasp how this story that I thought was only really relevant to a few people in my most immediate life actually resonated to this wide community. And as I'm sitting trying to grasp this, I also suddenly start to see my life in a new way. It's as if I'm standing at the stern of my life's boat, looking back at the wake, and suddenly I see these two forces within me. The one represented by my mother's grim look, sort of saying, we shall not, we must not, we cannot know anything about what happened, we cannot talk about it, we certainly cannot feel it. And the other part of me desperately wanting to try to know, searching for ways, not even consciously, but there were these two forces as I look back and suddenly memories of my life start to come over me with a whole new set of meaning and memories that I've never really even thought about very much before. For instance, I'm 19 years old, now living in Yonkers, New York. My friend Randy Levy and I are taking the obligatory trip to Europe and we get into Paris and we rent our car, which is a Citroën de Chevaux. <laughs> Two horsepower. <laughs> I mean, to give you an idea of what a car it was, we were going up the Alps, we're going up the Alps, we're sort of stuttering up the Alps. And three or four bicycles just went by. <laughs> it's very disturbing. 
somehow or another, I, I don't know how it happened, we find ourselves on the outskirts of Munster. I don't remember ever saying to Randy, let's go to Munster, but there we were in a youth hostel on the outskirts of Munster. And we're planning to go the next day into the town. I have no particular idea what I'm going to do, but that's the plan. So night comes and 20 boys or so are in this dormitory and we all go to sleep and my bunk is at the furthest sort of against the wall and the only sound in the place is the sound of 20 boys breathing and snoring and 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning I, I'm woken by something like a nightmare and, and I'm sort of overwhelmed with, with sobs and I'm struggling to hold them down and not make a noise and not embarrass myself or my friend and I spent what feels like hours grappling with that until finally dawn breaks and I rush over to Randy and I say, come on, we've got to get out of here, we've got to get out of here, I can't go into that town. And Randy sort of never seemed to even blanch, he, he just packed his backpack and didn't ask me any questions. We went to our car and drove away. I never made it into the town and I don't remember ever thinking about what made it so difficult, I just forgot about it. Maybe something like 35 years later, I had another opportunity to go to Minster. I'm now living in Boston, it's 1991. My mother has gone back to South Africa. And she calls me to say that the town of Munster is inviting the Jews of Munster who were, who were forced to leave to come back with their families in a kind of Wiedergutmachung, the German word for making things better. And my mother wants me to know that my brother and I are invited to come. I'm completely alienated from my brother, I should say, for reasons that are complicated, but I'll talk about. And she tells me that he's already agreed that I should feel free to come or not come. I hang up the phone and I, and I turn to Vivian, and my wife, and I say, I can't go. I'm going to create a scene. I can't walk around there and try to be nice to those people. I'll embarrass my mother. I can't walk around and shake their hands and drink coffee and make nice talk. There's no way I can go. I can't go. And I don't go. My brother and my mother go, and they spend a week there. About three months later, I visit my mother in South Africa. see the grimmest look I've ever seen on her face. And she said there was one terrible moment. They took us to the train station mm. and they showed us where the Jews of Minster would gather the night before they were deported to Riga concentration camp. And they showed us that a chicken coop had been built there and that my mother and father and brother spent the night with their friends and relatives in that chicken coop. I'm unable to say anything more to her. I try to change the subject, and I try not to think about it again. I want to give you an idea just how dramatically that part of me that did not want to know worked on me, how effective it was, how powerfully I blanked out anything to do with the Holocaust and all that happened. It's 1975 and my family and I are living in Amherst, Massachusetts. Vivian and I are graduate students. And the whole town is talking about watching the film The Holocaust, the television movie The Holocaust, which was going to be broadcast that night. Many of you might have seen it. Meryl Streep played them, the main part. The thing is that as the whole town is talking about this, I realize that I have no plans to watch it whatsoever. It's not only that I don't have no plans to watch it, I've never even thought about watching it. It's as far removed from me as anything can be. And I'm sort of shocked by this. How can I, me of all people, 
be so clueless about what happened. And so I start to read, finally. And the first book I read is probably one that many of you may have read first, Elie Wiesel's Night. That was published in 1959, and it opened up the gates of conversation. Because until 1951, until 1959, nobody spoke about what happened. The victims, the perpetrators, the liberators, no one. Wiesel's book is published and people start to talk for the first time. And Wiesel's book obviously had a huge impact on me. I mean, it's almost unbearable to read. And I needed more. I needed something else. And I find myself reading Bruno Bettelheim's book, The Informed Heart. It's a book Bettelheim wrote. You may know the name. He was a very famous psychoanalyst living in the United States for many years. He spent one year in Dachau concentration camp. This is before the death camps were established. And he wrote a book about his experiences there, describing his effort to understand how people survived and how they died. And in this book, the title tells you everything that he's trying to say, the informed heart. He is trying to say to us, we need in this era to develop the capacity to be truly and to truly understand what's going on around us and also to be able to feel deeply. And I'm so taken by the way Bettelheim writes and he contributes so much to my understanding that I start reading everything he's written. And I start writing to him on typewriters, remember those things? Right? I start writing to him and to my amazement, by return mail I get a reply from this strange graduate student who's writing to him from Amherst, he sends by return mail a reply. And we have this correspondence, and I hear that he is retiring in Stanford, California, where Vivian and I go to each year to visit her parents, and we go to Stanford, California, uh, to San Francisco, and as soon as we get there, I call Bettelheim up and say, hi, Ron Goldman here, I've been the one writing to you. I would love it if we can come and visit you, he says. Now, can we not talk on the phone? No, I really want to come and visit. All right, Sam, come. So Vivian and I go to his house in Stanford. We all sit in his living room, and he says, so what can I do for you? I say, well, Dr. Bettelheim, I've come here to invite you to a conference in Amherst on understanding children. I'm thinking that it should be about five days long, and uh, I'd love it if you can do it. Vivian looks at me absolutely stunned. He's never heard me say anything like this before. It wasn't even part of my idea to say this, but there I was. I thought it's kind of small talk, you know. But Bettelheim says, all right, we can talk about this, but we must agree on the date, the time, and the fee. So I say, okay, how about uh, last week of July 1979 and a fee of $3,000? Looks in his calendar. Yes, that will work. That's very good. So we walk out of there in a state of total dismay. What are we going to do now? The only graduate students that we are. But we show up at the dean's office and I tell the dean that I have the most famous psychologist living in the United States agreed <coughs> to come and have this conference. And they go crazy, but they get it together. It's very nice. And the night before the conference, Bruno Bettelheim is coming to our graduate student apartment in Amherst to have dinner with us. It's a special evening. Vivian has made a wonderful dish. We have our two children dressed in their very best. Um, Aunt Mikey is there, that's Vivian's aunt, who's also a refugee from Nazi Germany, dressed beautifully with her lovely blouse. And we all sit down and we serve the food. And Bettelheim doesn't really eat very much. He just picks at his food. And I start trying to make conversation, and I start talking, and Bettelheim says nothing. I start to feel the panic rising. <laughs> I'm starting to perspire very, very much. And I start to speak about any topic that can come into my mind. Uh, race in the United States, and the state of psychoanalysis. And Bettelheim says nothing. In a growing panic, I start to say, isn't it terrible how the Israelis torture Palestinians? He puts down his knife and fork. 
So you would rather have the Jewish workers their heads bowed into the concentration camps. So easy for you in your nice apartment here in Amherst to make these great pronouncements. You've had no children blown up in buses, have you? Vivian leaves, the children leave, Mighty leaves, and I'm all alone in a state of complete panic. The reason I'm in a state of panic, though, is I really don't have anything to reply to Belheim. I begin to realize that I've just absorbed this idea from the environment. I haven't really thought about it. It's not that he was wanting me to, to, to sort of just agree with him. He was looking to see if I had really gone through something to arrive at that opinion. So I start trying another topic. I don't even remember what it is anymore. Moving my chair closer and closer to him, and he challenges me on it. And each occasion, I find I haven't really gone through anything to understand what I'm even saying. And he's teaching me something of huge importance. And he's teaching me also as a man who is deeply familiar, because the sound of his accent, the reason I can imitate his accent as I can is because it's one I've heard all my life. And this man is speaking to me as the grandfather I never met. The next day, the conference begins, and he sort of yells at people fairly considerably through those five days. Uh, a memorable event it was for us, and a memorable event for many people. I mean, many years later, somebody came to me, recognized that I had been responsible for that conference, and said, I still remember what happened with Bruno Bettelheim, even though I don't remember anything that at a conference I attended last week. <coughs> So it was an unforgettable experience. And you would think from an experience like that, given the importance of Bettelheim and the fact that I was reading about the Holocaust at last, that somehow this would be on my mind in an ongoing way, but not at all. In fact, I remember for many years after that not paying much attention to anything to do with those, those events. And then had an experience where I also understood that a part of me was always absorbed in what happened there, and I want to tell you that story. But first, a little background. When I was growing up in South Africa, we were required to recite Shakespeare monologues as part of our matriculation exam. And the monologue I chose when I was 17 years old is a monologue from uh, Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar, the part where uh, Mark Antony is speaking to dead Caesar's body right after the assassins have left the room. And I learned that monologue then, recited it, and I tortured my family with that monologue for years after that. It's the only Shakespeare I knew, and I recited it at every opportunity. So one day, 1995, I'm now a psychotherapist, and we're living in Boston. A few of us shrinks meet Tina Packer, the artistic director and founder of Shakespeare and Company. And we are impressed by the way she teaches actors, so we ask her to run a theater workshop for our shrinks. And the way Tina runs these workshops is she asks you to deliver a monologue, and she's going to coach you on it. Well, of course, for me, it was easy. I was going to choose my monologue. No problem. Nothing to worry about. So my turn comes, and I start with the opening lines of this monologue. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. So Tina stops me and says, so Ron, what do you see when you say those lines, thou bleeding piece of earth? Initially, I thought she was quite crazy to ask me a question like that. But suddenly, coming into my mind, my mind's eye is the image of my Uncle Eric, my mother's brother, lying dead and bleeding on the ground, having been murdered by the SS in the forced death marches that occurred as the SS moved prisoners in advance of the liberating armies. It was a stunning moment for me, as you might imagine, and I've thought about it many, many times over. It led me to understand why I ever chose that monologue in the first place. Why it was such an important monologue to keep on reciting over all these years? Because it gave form to feelings and images 
that were hanging out of every corner of my house growing up. From the carpets and the curtains and the walls, these feelings were present, but never spoken about. And this monologue gave some way to give expression to those feelings. And Tina asks me to say the monologue again, the opening line. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. It's not only the case that these two sides of me at war with each other were revealed to me as I'm thinking about my life from this new perspective, but suddenly aspects of my life that had puzzled me for a long time were starting to be explained in new ways. I mean, for instance, I mentioned that my brother and I are so completely alienated from each other. He, for instance, has a vastly different experience of my mother. He speaks of her as, as abandoning and unavailable to him, whereas I have the sense of a rich, deep, connected relationship with my mother, and I could never understand that. Until suddenly I have this image of my parents in 1944, hovered over a small black pump radio, vinyl covered with those little dials tuning in, tuning in. 1944 is the year I was born, trying to tune in to the BBC to get the news. And the news they're hearing in 1944 is the armies are liberating Europe. Concentration camps are being opened up and refugees are being housed in all parts of Europe. And I imagine hope rising with great force as they listen to these news reports. 1945, 1946, 1947, the news worsens and worsens until the report is confirmed. Her parents are murdered in Riga and her brother is killed in the death march. And in 1948, my brother is born and he's named Eric. And so he grows up with a mother very different from the mother who gave birth to me in 1944, a mother full of hope whereas he grew, uh, grew, spent his first years with the mother in deep depression, I think, because she never ever spoke about it. I thought, as of 1998, that I actually knew everything there was to know, or the little that there was to know, I thought I knew. But in 1998, I'm visiting my mother in, in South Africa. And by chance, when the phone rang, I picked it up, and it's the Shoah Foundation. You know the foundation that Steven Spielberg started to collect the stories of survivors? And I'm answering the phone, and they say they want to come and speak to my mother. I agree immediately. Hang up the phone, tell my mother. I know that if she picked up the phone, she would have declined. I tell her how important it is that we try to do this together. And so, after she agrees, we meet. She takes out a file that I've never seen before. We're sitting in her bedroom, hot South African breeze blowing through light blue curtains. She opens up this file and the first thing that appears is 
the Red Cross Telegram. Starting in 1940 or so, the only ways Jews in Germany, at any rate, could communicate with the outside world was through Red Cross telegrams. They were permitted 50 words. I'd heard about the telegram, but never seen it. Hilda, we're going to be gone for a long time. We will be in touch with you as soon as we return. And then she shows me a letter from her brother, Eric, written in 1936. It's a letter filled with optimism and good stories, how he has a job, how there's no, what's the point of trying to emigrate? Everything is so good here. And the look on my mother's face is much more complex now than just grim. It's a look of dismay and confusion and guilt. put that down. And then she tells me something I've never heard. My brother, her brother, was meant to be part of the kinder transport and taken to England. But he never showed up. Only his suitcase showed up. His suitcase showed up in Southampton. Was picked up by the people to whom he was supposed to go to. I hear the story, it feels impossible to take in, and I'm sort of I'm done with it. Put it aside and try not to think about it, and think it's gone from my mind and heart. Until just last year, I've registered for a writing class, and the assignment I'm responsible for is to write a story about an interrupted trip, and I go through my usual thing, you know, I have no story to tell, there's nothing I can do, I'm driving Vivian crazy about this, and depressed and miserable until I wake up one morning with a story in my mind and I write it out and it goes something like this. A young man is packing his suitcase. When he's finished, he and his parents go to the railroad station and check that suitcase in and get ready to get on the train. But an Oberstuhlfuhrer says, nobody else on the train, everybody home. You can try again tomorrow. And back they go to their house. <coughs> that night, they turn on their radio and they go to the news where they hear that England has declared war against Germany. And they know there will be no more kinder transport. And the suitcase makes its way to Southampton. One very big recovery of a part of myself needed to happen before it was going to be possible for me to tell a story like this. And that is the part of me that is German. A part of me that I've always felt with Vivian very ambivalent about, as you can imagine. I grew up, my parents forbidding me from speaking German because they're afraid that will be seen as enemy aliens. So German is the hated language, the forbidden language. It's something full of hate and distaste. And yet, it's so intimate. My parents speak it with each other. Their friends speak it with each other. We eat German food. We listen to German music. And that part of me that is also German was as far away from me as anything could be. Until Vivian and I together decided almost to storm the place because we've got a friend, or a relative really, named Gordon, who lives in Berlin, in a suburb called Van, or Berlin called Wannsee, and we're going to visit him at last. This is just a few years ago. 
And in Wannsee, we go to the Wannsee Museum, which is actually based in what was originally known as the Wannsee House. The Wannsee House was the place where January 20th, 1942, 12 German bureaucrats met under the chairmanship of Heydrich with Eichmann present to discuss the Jewish problem. Six of the 12 people at that table had PhDs. Careful minutes were kept. The Wannsee House is indeed now a museum that documents the bureaucratic history that led to the mass killing that took place later and that was decided upon in that room, that central room of the Wannsee House. Each room documents a different portion of that history. And one of the more astonishing things that I'm seeing as I walk through this museum is in each one there is a class of 20 or so German students listening to their teachers talk about these events. The students are rapt and obviously dismayed, dismayed and amazed as they listen. But it's very moving to watch this happening. Finally, I make my way to the main room where this huge table sits. And at each place is a biography of one of the bureaucrats who was present at that meeting. I sit down at Eichmann's place and pick up some headphones to listen to whatever it is I'm going to hear. And what I'm listening to is an event that occurs during the Eichmann trial when one of the judges who was a German-speaking judge, the Israelis insisted on German-speaking judges so that Eichmann would always have to be able to understand what was happening. This judge says, Warum haben Sie Schnaps getrunken und Zigarre gerauchen? Why did you have brandy and cigar after the meeting? And I listened to Eichmann's answer because Heydrich never expected it to be so easy. So we were celebrating. The next day, we go to the center of Berlin. There's a three-city block memorial there. Not to the Holocaust, no. The Germans have insisted on calling it the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. And I walk through this memorial on the ground level. It consists of 4,000 stelae or concrete blocks of different shapes and sizes on an uneven floor. And as I walk, my family disappears here and I see them there. It's a sense of complete disorientation and confusion as I walk through a place that is commemorating the killing of untold numbers of unnamed individuals. And suddenly, in the midst of that, there's a small staircase that leads down into the ground into the information center. Here is a shop with various books and documents. Here is a wall that documents the, the different concentration camps that were established by the Nazis, and there are hundreds of them. And I'm walking along this wall, looking at this documentation, and suddenly I turn the corner, and I'm in a completely darkened room that's illuminated only by glass panels embedded on the floor, about four across and five down. And there, maybe 10, 15 people standing there in complete silence, reading these coffin-shaped illuminated panels, upon which are excerpts from diaries written by individual Jews who were murdered. People in the room with me, all of us, are in a state of grieving and overcome with the shock of what we're witnessing here. And as the feelings finally come, finally I can mourn in a public place, I have this other part of me that feels this huge gratitude to those Germans and to that part of Germany that had the will and the desire and the vision to make it possible for me 
and others to have a public place to mourn. And then an astonishing thing happens just this past year. An Israeli named Chanoch Tsevi makes a film called Hitler's Children documenting the stories of four descendants of the worst of the monsters. And Hanoch says, I've made this film, he's a third generation descendant of survivors, I've made this film because it's very important for us to recognize we have something in common with these people. We need to share our stories, second and third generation survivors. And there in this film, four different individuals describe their very different ways of coming to grips with what they had to face. For instance, Bettina Goering, the grandniece of Hermann Goering, second in command of that great Third Reich. She lives off the grid in New Mexico, having sterilized herself so that her genes do not go one yard further into the and here we see Monica Goethe, the daughter of Amon Goethe, the monster depicted in Spielberg's film Schindler's List who shot Jews from the balcony of his house. And we see stamped on her face the agony of trying to face who her father really was. And here is Niklas Frank, the son of Max Frank, the governor general of Poland, who's written a book, Der Vater, which every sentence of which is designed to kill his father again. And Niklas Frank travels through Germany reading from this book to young people. And he does it, he says, because I need to execute this monster every single day. <laughs> and finally, Katrin Himmler, the grandniece of the bureaucratic monster, Heinrich, who is married in Israeli, and they have a son together. The Israeli is also descendant of survivors. And Katrina describes how against great resistance she's tried to find out what her whole family, her uncles as well as her father, her grandfather, did during the Nazi era. And she says, I have refused to change my name because I will not take the easy way out and let myself forget from where I come. But she writes a book called Himmler's Children, she says, dedicated to her son, so that he will not have to endure facing that kind of resistance herself, himself. And it's these Germans who give me the final sort of spurt of inspiration I needed to be able to, against great resistance, try to tell you my story. And one final episode to that story. You remember Herbert and Mariana, the couple who had the Cocker Spaniel Psyche and Eros? Well, it's now 1971, and I'm back in South Africa. Actually, I had landed a job at the university in Johannesburg there. And um, I'm preparing my lectures. You know, Psyche and Eros, I should mention, by the way, is, is many of you might know, is, is the earliest and perhaps one of the greatest love stories. Uh, it's a magnificent story about how Psyche searches for her husband, who she's lost, Eros, and finally they meet again after much turmoil, and they're so happy to see each other, they get married a second time, and they give birth to a child named Joy. Well, Herbert one day is on the phone with me and saying, Ronnie, that's how they spoke about me. That's how they called me in South Africa. 
My niece Vivian is coming from America uh, in a few weeks. Would you be willing to take her around Johannesburg and show her the town? All right, I say, and hang up the phone and go about my business. Three weeks later, the phone rings again. A very young sounding girl's voice on the phone. Hello, this is Vivian. Uh, Herbert said that you might take me around the town. Uh, if you would, that would be great. Okay, yes, yes. I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this? So I call my friend Harold. And I say, Harold, your younger brother David has always wanted to meet an American girl. I've got just the ticket for him. And he agrees. We set the day. Off I go on this particular date in my little uh, Mini Cooper, which we had in those days too. And I drive to Sydney, which is the suburb where Herbert lives, and I knock on the door. It's a moment we've both never forgotten. And together we went to Zoo Lake, which is a uh, place pretty similar to the Boston Common, very large lake surrounded by willow trees. And we sit under one of those willow trees and we talk all day and for the next 42 years, <laughs> trying to reconstruct from very little, all that happened. We have two children, Anika and Michael, and two grandchildren, Dylan and Josh. And this story that I'm telling you is a story ultimately about the victory of Eros over Thanatos, the victory of love over death. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all very much for listening the way you did. I just want to acknowledge Amy Goldfarb here, who was my director and coach throughout this process, and without whom I couldn't have done this. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to hang around. If anybody wants to have a conversation, I'll be happy to do that. Thanks, everybody.